here for this event that's co-hosted by Children's Hospi Hospices across Scotland, Sue Ryder and Marie Curie. Three organisations I know from my own role as health and social care correspondent at the BBC that do absolutely terrific work across Scotland. The, the session today is all about exploring better collaboration between health and social care partnerships and third sector organisations and trying to make sure that services are really well integrated and that people get the right care at the right time in the right place. I'm sure you all have experience of that too and have quite a lot to say. This session, as well as hearing from our panel, is all about hearing from you as well. So I hope that when we get to the stage of questions from the floor, you'll all really make a contribution and have a, a good discussion with, with the panelists who are here. I mean, from my point of view, I'm hoping to learn something. I would say it's, it's probably no surprise to hear that I generally get to know about the stories when things aren't working so well, uh, but I want to hear a bit more about what is working and about how things could work even better in the future. So I'm hoping over the course of an hour to learn a lot. But let's kick off maybe by getting a, a brief introduction from each of our four panelists who are here. I'll introduce them all uh, from the far end towards me. We have uh, David Lees from Marie Curie and next to him, Eleanor Jane from Sue Ryder. We have um, Maria McGill from the Children's Hospices across Scotland and then Alison Taylor, who's Head of Integration Division at the Scottish Government Health and Social Care Directorate. So it'd be great if you would welcome them all. Thank you. So let me start with, with you, David. How would you say the situation is at the moment, just from, from your perspective? Okay. Um, thank you for your applause. <laughs> um, so the situation uh, is, is a little mixed just now, so just a little bit of background. Marie Curie has um, agreements with all of the, or 30 of the IGBs across Scotland. Uh, to over the boards across Scotland. They've been in existence for a period of time. Um, and so there's an aspect of that that has led to business as usual for us because there's continuity of those services, continuity of care, of course, so from that side, which is very good, very positive. Uh, but with regard to the organisational structural changes, I guess it's mixed. So there are some areas um, where the arrangements are more straightforward, uh, the new arrangements um, where there's been a, a fairly uh, seamless transition, particularly in those areas where the individuals themselves have not changed. So those responsible for commissioning and those responsible for those commissioning relationships with us. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, they, they are, uh, they've been more straightforward. Where there have been larger scale change in the organisations and where personnel have moved around and sometimes there have been multiple uh, changes, we found that that's become a little bit more challenging and where it's obviously more challenging for us I'm sure it's equally as challenging for, for the IGBs themselves. So we appreciate that and we understand that. Um, we have uh, continued uh, to engage as much as, as we possibly can and where there are opportunities to do that, uh, these have continued to be successful and, and uh, services uh, are maintained. But I guess uh, going forward now, um, what we need to be clear about is um, a more settled uh, transition to make sure that the services continue to be fit for purpose and are aligned with how the wider system changes are going forward across the IGBs. Thank you very much. Uh, Eleanor, do you see any particular challenges? I mean, we're more than a year into now the, the, the integration. Is it going as smoothly as you had hoped or are there more problems than you would have expected? Well, as a, so Sue Ryder operate in about six IJB areas to varying degrees. And I think that there are challenges and things that are working well, things that are not working well, but it's very different in every IJB area. So it very much depends on the relationship that we have with the IJB locally and with commissioners. It depends very much on how the IJB is set up, what their structures are like. It depends on how much time we've got to invest in relationships with IJBs. 
So we find this, uh, we find this one of the greatest challenges that we want to engage with um, integration authorities but this can be such a time consuming exercise and as a third sector organisation we don't have a team of people who can go out there and do that engagement and relationship building. So um, it really depends on a whole range of factors as to how successful our relationship is. But I think one thing is really clear and that is that as a third sector organisation we've got an awful lot to learn at the same time as the integration authorities. So we're really keen to work with them so that we can actually um, work together and overcome the challenges together and don't want to be seen um, from a, provide, a provider sort of commissioner split. We want to, be see, to work in partnership to make sure that we can get the services right for people on the ground. Thank you. Maria, I mean, obviously, um, the whole point about local working is local decisions might mean that it is different in one area to another, as, uh, you know, as, as Eleanor has found out. I mean, have, have you found that a particular challenge with children's hospitals across Scotland? I think there are a, a number of challenges for CHAS. So we do work across every local authority, every health and social care partnership area. Uh, in terms of CHAS, we, have, we provide uh, care and support to children, babies, children, young people with a life-shortening condition and their families. Uh, the numbers are small. Uh, although larger than people might think. So research which was published a couple of years ago told us that there are 15,500 uh, babies, children and young people in Scotland with a life-shortening condition and about 2,200 of those would have a condition which is, uh, could be classified as unstable, deteriorating or the child could be dying. And of the 450 children in Scotland who die every year, 195 of those approximately would have palliative care needs. And at the moment, we only reach one in three of those children who are dying. So we have families in every local authority area, which is great. Uh, but we also know that if we think about those children who are dying, 75% of the children who die, die in hospital. And so there's a, for us a, a, an interesting challenge of working with IJBs where children and their families spend most of their time in local communities, but their connections are with acute hospitals. We also know that of the strategic plans that have been developed by IJBs, none of them mention uh, children's palliative care. Uh, they don't need to have uh, a children's part to that plan. Some have chosen to, uh, but many haven't. And I understand that. It's small numbers. It's really complicated. Families in local communities are, are hidden. Uh, people tend not to know about them and that may be because they have a great deal of connection with the acute hospital and it may be that the community just struggles to know what to do. Uh, so we have engaged with some health and social care partnership consultation events, only a handful and of those it's, it was really tricky actually to talk about children's palliative care and we absolutely understand that. Uh, the other challenge for IGBs from our uh, perspective is that um, because as a national body of, of the nature that we are, we are in the very unique and uh, fortunate position of having national funding from the NHS, which is managed nationally. So there's, it's just, it's an interesting challenge. We need to know what's going on locally so that we can work alongside local providers with the team around a family, because a family has a big team around them, but it's how we do that in a uh, positive and uh, with a positive outcome for families. Thank you, Maria. Well, Alison, obviously, Scotland is further ahead than the rest of the UK in, in integrating health and social care. There's, there's no doubt about that. But listening to the, the three panellists, obviously, there are some challenges. What, what, what would you say about the, the progress that's been made so far? Is it as, as smooth and as fast as you would have hoped? Um. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to have, to have the opportunity to come here, to talk to you, to hear what you're thinking. Looking forward to that bit in a minute, and indeed to be on the stage with colleagues here from different sectors. Is it as smooth or as fast as I would have hoped? Um, is anything ever? <laughs> I'm not sure. I think you have to be um, quite, quite a pragmatist, actually, to work in this area of public service reform. It's, it's also the most extraordinary privilege to work in this area of, of reform. Um, I think it's a, an almost uniquely um, multifaceted part of policy involving so many different people and touching every single one of us in some way, in different ways from year to year. 
I, I've been in amongst this for, for years now, um, coming up for 10 years actually, working on integrating health and social care. You might just as easily ask me if I'm going fast enough, frankly, I think, and it would be a fair question. I think it, one of the things I love about it is what we are trying to do is so easily expressed. Um, where more and more people live with a range of things for which they need support, a range of conditions or a range of social or medical needs. We have to make the support for those needs join up. We, we just have to, it's common sense. When we don't, we deliver a poorer quality service, we don't help people in the way that we could, and we don't make the best use of resource. It's, it's not an activity that's just for statutory agencies. It has to be for communities, for people working in third sector organizations, for independent providers of care as well. All of that is really easy to say, and even I have never met anyone who disagreed with it. The challenge, of course, comes in actually making it work and getting organizations, some of them very large, some of them very small, to work together in ways that can be quite contrary to their long, long-standing patterns of working. But even more difficult than that, I think, is genuinely making good on this idea that we need to put people who are using services and their families at the center of care. And again, it's really easy to say, and again, it is harder to do. I think there's actually been um, tremendous progress around the country. One of the things that's good about this job is I get to go out and about and speak to people a lot in local systems, and I hear quite a lot. Um, some of it surprisingly uplifting, actually, because it's very easy from day to day to be squarely focused on what's not there yet. And there's plenty of things that aren't, so it's definitely a journey. We're definitely only part of the way along it. Um, I don't know how far it will progress um, even in my lifetime, say, but we're going in the right direction. And I think we can have some confidence in the framework, the basic framework we've got now. And I think we should keep going. I'm a great believer in keeping going. Thanks, Alison. Well, I wonder, just um, picking up on what Alison said, um, how much of it is a, is a cultural issue in people just really being slow to change the way they work. I don't know if, if any of our other three panelists have got maybe some tangible examples of, of where it, it's actually worked, breaking down the, the, the cultural differences between partners. Well, I think um, the third sector is, I think, uniquely positioned to be able to adapt to change really easily. And I think it's because we're slightly different to the public sector in that we are closer. I don't, maybe this is you know, speaking in too large terms, but we are very close to the people that we provide care and support to. And so when we see challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, we um, I think, tend to be much quicker to adapt. So that we're in a constant state of change, well, for cer certainly in Sue Rider, in a constant state of change and adapting to the needs of the people that we um, support. So I think that sort of culture is kind of where integration authorities can learn from the third sector, because third sec for, um, integration authorities are trying to bring all these different organizations together and must not lose sight of the reason that they are there providing these services is for the people that they're providing care and support to and they've got to remain the focus of everything and um, that they aim towards so I think like, well I think the third sector are very um, good and need, but we need to be better at sharing how we do that with integration authorities so that we can work more in partnership to adapt to changing needs and, and what's the practical experience? Do you think that that is happening? Do, do, do you think integrated joint boards are, are keen to learn, David? Yeah, I do. Oh. I think, um, sorry. No, 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 go no, ahead. No, you no, well, no. you, you <laughs> tell me and then we'll move on. Yeah. Go on. And there's a couple of um, places where we operate. So, for instance, in Stirling and Clacks IJB, we provide home care and we're on the planning delivery group. So on a day-to-day -day basis, or planning strategy group, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we can report to the IJB the problems and concerns that we're coming across about um, how slow things may be moving in a certain area or a change in one area to do with, say, prescribing and what impact that has on our home care staff to be able to give medicines to people that we provide care for. And because of that forum, these problems can quickly be overcome and that means that we're better able to support people to live at home and not end up in hospital. So there's definitely examples out there, but I think it very much depends on local relationships. Uh, lots I agree with there. I think, you know, 
I would argue, and I'm uh, perhaps biased, but that's okay, um, that palliative <laughs> care is, is at the center of person-centeredness, and that's, that's one of the origins of person true person-centeredness, which is, I believe, one of the, the true drivers behind an integrated approach to care, having people at the center, decision-making in localities. Um, I think palliative care has been there for a long time. The re realistic medicine agenda, for example, another good example of that, where what matters to you um, is, is really one of our, our key drivers of how we operate. And so therefore, I think that we bring with us an ethos and a culture that is, uh, and I see it in our discussions with our uh, colleagues, our partners, um, that, that says, look, uh, there are different ways of doing this. It's not necessarily just about, um, you know, significant structural organizational change. It can be about how we think and about the way of being with ourselves in a room and our partnerships and how we operate together, we can definitely learn from that. And I, I, the, the best of the partnerships and the best of the arrangements we have definitely operate on that basis. And question. Maria, you, any thoughts on this? We have engaged with IGBs at a national level, so we have struggled, I have struggled to engage with individual IGBs. And that may uh, say much more about me than it does about integrated joint boards. I completely understand that. I've spoken to arranged a meeting with the national group of uh, the chief officers and we struggled to get a number of them there. The people that we did have were very interested and actually they were astounded, I think is the right word, at the breadth and depth of care and support that Chaz offers and provides to families and actually the support that we offer to our statutory colleagues. Uh, I know from our family support team that we are doing more and more of what might be considered statutory social work because of the, uh, the lack of um, individual practitioners on the ground. It's not a lack of willingness, it's simply a lack of, of practitioners. So, you know, I have struggled. We've talked with our colleagues at uh, the National Chief Officers at Board how we might work more closely together. Could we work in regions, <coughs> excuse me, could we work in clusters? But I, we, that's as far as our conversation has gone. They have many more uh, challenges to consider, not least the older population. But I would argue, and if we think about adverse childhood experiences, then actually it would be really important that we support the families that we are supporting in order to make sure that they are, um, when their child dies, that they are able to participate uh, in the community as we would wish and to reduce the impact of a childhood death on siblings, on brothers and sisters, on families, and indeed in the wider community. Alison, is this struggle that, that Maria paints a picture of something that, that you recognise? And is it, is it enough just to blame individual IJBs or does it, does it really require more leadership from a national level to try and get over some of this? I think there's an interesting degree of variation in what's going on. Maria's referred to the fact that some of the IJBs, the integration joint boards, these, these things that bring together the responsibilities of health boards and local government social work departments into a shared place, um, about a third of them look after children's social care and the other two thirds don't. And that was a choice that was left to them. I could probably give an hour long presentation on why that choice was left to them and I won't do that. I don't think you'd thank me for it. But it's interesting to see how it's playing out because I think it's really easy when you sit in a national seat as I do to talk about the virtues of localism um, and then actually perhaps not act in a way that supports local decisions at all, but instead issue instructions from the middle. So this is an area where we see real variation according to what was agreed were local priorities. And, and I, I have to be fairly careful what I say, but what I would say is this, and I'd be interested to know if you agreed with this, where children's care is part of the integrated arrangements, my observation is that the chief officers, the people who are in charge of that, are passionate about it. They are passionately positive about the fact it's in. And I think that that is an interesting reflection and one that I think is of interest to ministers as well. Um, we have a lot of work underway, but it's, it's about the whole population, if you like, looking at progress in terms of the things that you can measure. And you know, there's always a risk in that because you measure what you measure and then that becomes what you're interested in. But with, with those risks in mind, 
we can see that there are areas where these integrated arrangements are having an effect. They are bringing down, we've mentioned the older population, they are bringing down unnecessary admission to, to hospital in the older population and this kind of thing. So we can see the start of a beneficial effect, but you're right, you can't have a situation where there's benefits in some places and they don't spread to others. And we need to be very mindful of that. Well, challenge it for necessary. So many of the stories I cover about why is that person there getting this when that person there doesn't seem anywhere close to getting that. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's an eternal dilemma it and uh, I'm sure you'd probably be very rich if you knew how, how to resolve it once yes. and for all. But um, before I open it up to the floor, I just wondered actually, Maria, do you agree with um, what Alison yeah. was saying? No, I, I would actually, and there, there are uh, two or three chief officers who are exactly that, very passionate about about uh, children's services and, and actually they are delighted that we are in their areas doing what we do mm -hmm. and it almost kind of lets them off the hook but I'm content with that to a degree but actually I think that there's a risk that there are other services in that area that we don't know about that, um, that they don't know about us and they don't know about the value of what we can do together so I think there is some work that we can do together but there's quite a bit of risk taking and maybe a bit of testing to do uh, before we get to that but more later. <laughs> Sorry I was just going to just to support the point that you're making there I think one of the other references on the page is about strategic involvement and I think that demonstrates absolutely why um, strategic involvement at a, at a strategic level is so critical to get context and to get an understanding of the wider system challenges in the wider system issues so is that there is a voice there saying we understand what's going on across the board what other services are there what other plans do you have but this service needs to be represented it's just a, a point i picked up when you said that. thanks very much well i would like to open it out to the floor because i'm sure you all work in uh, areas where you've got, got some experience and some uh, questions really to ask of the panel. So don't, don't be shy, um, please. This is your opportunity to make your point, but also maybe to find out things from the panelists. It would be great um, if you wait until the roving microphone comes to you. And also, if you could introduce yourself to everybody else. I mean, is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Uh, this lady. Thank you. Uh, my name's Barbara and I work for a third sector interface, um, but I am funded by a health and social care partnership. And uh, just to echo what the speakers were saying, um, we had a forum where we were looking at the ministerial strategic group for health and community care. And the overriding theme of the day was the inconsistencies across the local authorities for the engagement with not only third sector interfaces but third sector organisations as a whole with the integrated joint boards and I suppose my question is it's a conundrum how do you keep things local but have a kind of consistency across the board where IGIBs I guess are aware and recognise the value of what third sector can bring to their service supplement? It's a good question. Eleanor, would you like to kick off? Yeah, I think it is a bit of a conundrum. And um, I think there's an assumption that larger charities um, will be able to have the resources to engage with TSIs across the whole country. And that's just not really the case. Well, certainly in Sue Ryder's case, that's just, that doesn't work because we're literally just focused on providing services and don't have that capacity to engage via TSIs. So we, we do where we can, and it's, been, and it's been a really mixed bag depending on all sorts of different factors, and it depends on how each individual TSI is set up, and like you say, how the I, IJB engages with that TSI. So I think when you, especially when you're a specialist um, provider, so we at Sue Rider provide home care, but we also provide specialist neurological care, it's difficult to expect a TSI who represents the whole of the third sector to be able to represent our views on neurological care, neurological commissioning, what works for people locally, to the IJB. So it's, it is a real difficult issue. And I, I know that the Scottish government, well, I think the Scottish government is looking into this issue of how um, TSIs and the third sector can influence IJBs. I do think that 
and I'm sure everyone will say this about every, every part of the system that doesn't quite work, is that resources are an issue because I, don't, I think it is really hard for TSIs, like I say, to represent all these diverse interests to the IJB and I'm, I'm hoping that resources will increase in future to make that more effective because I think that investment in TSIs and third sector engagement can make, ultimately will make a huge difference to the way IJBs commission services and ultimately to the services that they provide. Alison, is the Scottish Government looking into this? Um, yeah, there is work to look into it. I think there's a more general point as well. Um, I remember saying when we were legislating around integration that one of its challenges is you can legislate for governance but you can't legislate for leadership. And I do think, to go back to an earlier point, there is a really key thing here about the importance of leadership in um, recognising and responding to it's two way. It's, it's both the third sector and, and the IGBs themselves recognising the uh, opportunity for the third sector to make an enormous contribution and, and being in a position to respond to it. I, c I can think of one particular example of an area where um, because of need, because there was a difficult situation to deal with and things were becoming very hard to manage sustainably, um, there, there was a real effort at partnership working with a, a range of third sector providers, not limited to the TSI, but, but everyone involved got round the table and actually came to a much more mature arrangement, uh, not only about how they would work together, but also, in fact, about how they would deliver care, how contracting arrangements would be put in place, and, and that sort of thing. There is, without question, I think, a, a responsibility on us and others who do sit in the middle to make sure that experience like that is shared and the kind of progress that's achieved, while it might not be directly transferable to another area, the, the, the substance of the progress is seen as something that's attainable and, and should be led for, if you see what I mean. So we have more to do, there's no question about it. Any other points before I move on? No? The woman at the front there, you, you had a question. It's, it's actually very similar, um, but I, I guess it's, it, it seems I've been working in this area, sorry, Ada MacDonald for Hospice UK, um, for a couple of years now, um, but before that in Parliament, so from a slightly different aspect. But co-production, to me, seems to be the mirage in the desert um, all the time for everyone. And I know, Alison, it's important to you as well. And we can't seem to really get there. And I think there's agreement that co-production will bring better outcomes. I mean, we're co-producing with, with health and social care partnerships, but also other, uh, other providers, um, the, the, the public sector carers um, who often get left out of these conversations and of course people who are actually needing these services and at the moment that doesn't seem to be happening it doesn't seem to be working and what we're seeing is is possibly um, some short-term uh, uh, symptoms of that which is very short-term funding models for hospices in many areas no service level agreements at all in place um, a lot of uncertainty, lack of coordination locally. The longer term um, outcomes, of course, will be poor care, poorly coordinated care, and, and charities having to pick up the slack, carers having to pick up the slack, and, 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 and the knock-on effect that'll have. So I guess I just want to qu question people on the stage, because they're there and I'm here, a little bit harder about what the solutions look like. Can we just leave it organically, share good practice, and hope somehow that works? Or do we need to institutionalize co-production and collaboration more firmly? Will that work? And if so, what does that look like? The, the TSIs, from what we're hearing, is, aren't quite working. Um, will indicators force the issue? Statutory guidance? I just, I just wondered if you had some solutions. Right, very firm question there. Thank you very much. I am going to pass that to you first, David. Do you think that co-production is the mirage in the desert. What, what, what would make this work? Uh, it, well, it, probably the straightforward answer is, uh, yeah, <laughs> it probably should be. Um, but as you said, um, the, the, the challenges and, and the practicalities. I can only give you um, what our experience has been. And surprise, surprise, it's been mixed. However, I can give you very positive examples of, of co-production, depending on how you define to what extent of co-production, but um, I wasn't going to specify any particular services, but there's a particular service in Glasgow that we've, we operate now um, that was very successfully derived out of conversations that, that evolved from uh, 
challenges that both the health and social care partnership had and strategic challenges that we had as an organisation. They had challenges around delayed discharges, we had challenges around the need to uh, make sure that more people were getting good and effective palliative care and were um, facilitated to die in their preferred place of death. And so through those conversations uh, that evolved through work with our, um, our teams, with carers, with our partners, we evolved the service that has gone from strength to strength in Glasgow and is um, hopefully very soon about to be signed up for another five years uh, progressing with a further service redesign evolving as a result of the wider system, evolving changes in the wider management of acute beds and the wider management of intermediate care and complex care and all of these other indicators. So that's a real live example of what I would describe as a version of co-production, I accept that you could argue that there are many other potential factors in co-production, but we'll have to take the examples that we think are, are positive. So. And that, that's a very positive example. I'm sensing frustration from, <laughs> <laughs> from the floor that maybe that's the exception rather than the rule. Um, anybody else got a view on that? Well, I guess, that, um, yeah, of the six um, IJB areas that we work across, there's maybe two where we could say we're involved pretty clearly in, in co-producing. For instance, in Aberdeenshire, we have been, the IJB has approached us to um, take part in their strategic commissioning and they're seeing us as a partner to help um, commission neurological services because they recognise that without getting expert providers, who actually um, work closely with people with neurological conditions, then there's no point in commissioning a specialist service without having that sort of involvement. So that's really, really positive. I think, um, I guess we do have to be careful that integration has only been officially um, up and running for the last couple of years. Obviously, it's been in train to varying degrees across the country for much longer. But I think, um, the, I guess in another year's time will be when IJBs will be coming up with their next three-year strategic plans. And I would hope that that's when we will see a bigger, a bigger step towards co-production. But I do think it is a process of ev evolution because there is so much change going on. Like, even if we don't see it, there is so much change going on. And I think that we need to take it increment incrementally to a certain extent. On the other hand, it is very frustrating when you do want to get in there and make a difference. Alison, um, do you sense the, the frustration and yeah. recognise the, the, the picture that's being painted there? I mean, third, third sector interfaces, I must say, are a bit of a mystery to me as a journalist. This is the first time I've heard of them. But uh, are they working? <laughs> Does there need to be more done from a national level? Um, I'm going to be contrary. I, rather than pass judgment on third sector interfaces, I'm going to say interfacing and co-producing with the third sector isn't mature enough yet. It's not there yet. <laughs> I won't say it's not working. There are examples where it's working and they're, they're, some of them are fantastic. It's not on the scale that's needed. Uh, yes, there will always be a need to look at the arrangements around that to make them work and, and that is something that, that some of my colleagues are looking at. Is it enough, I might be misquoting you, but is it enough to, to leave them to get on with it and see what emerges? Well, I don't think that's what's happened. I mean, it, the Scottish Government has legislated to make health and social care work together and it's legislated to give a statutory position to third sector representatives within those arrangements. Um, I, I would be the last person on earth to suggest that that's working perfectly and I'm probably an expert on its imperfections. Um, but the but that has happened. That, that's, that doesn't mean that people are being left to get on with it. And I think the other thing is we have a lot of work underway now to understand from a different angle what that means to people who are using services. Now, that, that's something that's under development, but I remember when I first came into health and social care policy, that the most constant criticism, and I think it was completely legitimate that I would get in a forum like this, would be, all you care about is delayed discharge. Um, all you care about is reducing pressure on hospitals. And people would say to me, well, yeah, of course, managing hospitals well, matters, but hospitals are made of brick. Reducing pressure on brick doesn't seem really like the right objective for a health and social care strategy. We should be improving outcomes for people. So 
I think we have a lot of work underway, well, I know we do, we have a lot of work underway to understand the impact of integration on the care that people experience, its quality and its sustainability, because both of those things matter to us all. But it, I, this will be at least the third time I've said this, I don't hesitate for a moment to agree it is a work in progress. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have made some progress. We have come some distance with plenty of scope to go. Probably a job in it till the end of my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I was um, in Westminster yesterday talking about the Scottish perspective on children's palliative care. And the, my colleagues from England were uh, talking to MPs about you know, the need for the absolute desperate need uh, in England for reform of social care and integration of health and social care. Two of the MPs in that committee were uh, Scottish and so I was asked to talk about my experience of health and social care integration and, and I uh, felt the need to be uh, what did you say? <laughs> quite positive about it to say that yes the vision is here in Scotland and there is legislation in place but it is only two years and in, in it's, it's in its infancy and I think if we need to as a community challenge it, support it, nurture it and take responsibility within the areas that we can to make it work and also trust our colleagues in policy and trust our colleagues in health and social care partnerships to get it right whilst also offering them some solutions and not be too upset when they don't take them. But I, you know, if I think about it at individual level, we've just completed transitioning 90 young people over a three year period from children's hospice services into adult services. And when we first talked about that with families, it, it was just devastating for them actually. Uh, and for the staff and families who have supported them for many years. But other than five for whom we are still supporting and still having very interesting and challenging conversations with health and social care partnerships, the rest have transitioned and many of them with incredible stories to tell and they have made different choices from the ones that I might have made, the practitioners around them might have made, but they have made choices uh, about their lives and they're living the lives in the way that they want to live them. And that's, I think, the outcome that we are striving to achieve. I'm not saying all of that was perfect, but what I'm saying is that the young people that we supported have made some choices and are now getting on with living their lives. Many of them, some have died, but many of them living their lives in, in different ways. Thanks, Maria. Um, some really good questions to kick off. Let's take some more contributions. Oh, there's a man there with his hand up. Just if you don't mind waiting for the mic to come and then just introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Ian Buchanan. For my sins, I'm the token public member on the West Lothian Integration Joint Board. I'm described as a user of care and of, of health. Can I lob three grenades into this discussion, please? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Firstly, can I talk about engagement? IGB is in West Lothian is currently looking at locality plans and engaging on them. The timescale for it was agreed in March of last year and 11 months on, the new timescale is 11 months behind where it was 11 months ago. And I think that tells you something. Secondly, I, there, there is a legal issue that I would like somebody to think about. Suppose an IGB wanted to do something innovative. It gets money from the health board and it gets money from a local council and it's a decision for the IGB as to how it distributes that money. But it cannot say we want the third sector to do X, Y or Z. It has to direct the money back to either the NHS or the council is not open to an IGB to say we want the third sector to do X. I think that needs to be looked at. And lastly, there's a feeling among some people I know locally uh, as to what, what actually is the IGB there actually there for? Theoretically, it is to determine policy and issue directions to the NHS and to the council as to 
what the services are and how it should be, how it should be done. But the reality is that we recently had a, a consultation by the local council on £68 million worth of council cuts, a lot of it in social care. And when the members of the IGB learned of this, even though we've still got the same officers dealing with the IGB as they're dealing with the council, um, we looked at it and said, we know nothing about this. And we wrote to the NHS Lovian and we wrote to West Lovian Council and we got nice letters back that really told us nothing terribly much. And I think the, the actual role of the IGB and the IGB members is still a bit vague as to what we're actually there for. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, three detailed but pretty important points, I think, from a user perspective. Uh, I wonder, Eleanor, if you'd like to... <laughs> you were looking at me, what can I say? <laughs> well, Never make eye contact. <laughs> yes, um, we don't provide services in West Lothian, so I'm not in a strong position to comment. No, and I'm not really... Lothian, I wouldn't expect you to answer no. the, the, the detail, but, you know, the three broad points, I mean, really, yeah. what is an IGB for? Um, and, you know, the whole issue of public engagement, I think, are really important points. Yeah, I think the public engagement is a really important point, and it's, it's engagement with the third sector again as well, and that'll be another challenge as IJBs move towards more genuinely locality planning, is how um, organisations such as Sue Ryder, Marie Curie and Chaz will actually engage on a locality basis will become potentially even more of a challenge. I think that... Um, what you were saying about um, the IJB commissioning or not commissioning third sector services was interesting. And the fact that cuts on social care were maybe not being communicated very well. But I think one thing that we hope that will become more and more the norm is the pooling of resources, which is obviously what IJB, one of the things IGBs were set up to do was be able to pool those resources and get more for their money because health and social care will be more joined up as a result. But, for instance, when it comes um, to neurological services, that hasn't necessarily, ha well, hasn't really happened at all in many areas. Um, as we found by um, research across the country, much of neurological services money is being retained within the acute sector. If that was moved to IJBs, then IJBs would be in a much stronger um, position to commission services that actually meet people's needs on the ground. So I think... It's, it's, like I say, a work in progress, it's something that we want to see a lot more progress on. But I think um, that pooling of resources is something that should potentially make a big difference in the future. Alison, I mean, it can yeah. be all too easy for any of us in any, any work that we do to actually lose sight of, of, of the people at the other end, the users. Um, the gentleman made quite a few yes. pertinent points. What do you think about that? I mean, are, are users at the centre of this? Um, yes, in some places, and some IJBs are stronger than others, and I'm not close enough to locality planning in West London, I have to admit, to understand what might be going on around engagement on that. The way you describe it is certainly concerning, um, and presumably it's something that's being challenged at the IJB. There are areas, there are IJBs, which are, through the detail of their um, the work they're doing on directions with the council and the health board, they are making sure that funding is directed to third sector organizations. It can be done. Um, it, it really requires everybody to get into the room together and work together and agree what the next steps are in delivering the services that are needed. What's it there for? Um, I do literally have an hour long presentation on this. I won't give it now, um, though I could do it from memory. I'm sure you can um, that yeah, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it brief. What's it there for? It's there to provide, to provide a single point of accountability for that pool of money, for that wealth of activity that goes around the care for people who tend to use different services for different things. And I think it's very interesting as I go around the country to um, take a, a personal view, which I shan't repeat, on how mature, or not in this forum, how mature that taking of accountability is in different IJBs, and it varies tremendously. So sometimes I go to places where I get exactly the question uh, this gentleman posed, what's it for? In other places, what I actually get is this blasted IJB, who do they think they are doing all these things? So, you know, there's a spectrum on that too. Um, it's, it's going to sound hackneyed, 
an awful lot of it is actually about leadership, I think, and taking, um, taking authority, if you like, for, for working through. But we've got to make this progress. Um, something I occasionally say to colleagues is, we have to integrate health and social care. That doesn't mean necessarily that we've got everything right at this point. You'd think I was a fool if I said that to you. But we do have to bring them together. We do have to make this objective work. And if that means going further and doing something else, maybe it does. Who knows? Um, so it's always useful to hear about the impediments to progress as well as to hear some stories about what is working. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take some more questions from the floor or views on how things are working. Come on. There must be some more burning questions, thoughts about what could be done better. Yes, this woman over here, if you just wait till the microphone gets to you and introduce yourself, that would be great. Thanks. Um, my name's Claire Hammond. I'm from a, a company called Rocket Science, and we support third sector and a lot of the health and social care partnerships. I can't hear you. Can, Can you just speak, speak up just that? a little oh, bit, please? I've never been accused of being too quiet before in my life. Um, <laughs> So I work at an organisation called Rocket Science and we support both third sector and a lot of the health and social care partnerships in Scotland, particularly as they're kind of bringing things together and figuring out how to do it as a, as a, a single group. Um, I am quite interested though in this tug between health and social care where sometimes in some partnership areas it feels like health is definitely winning the uh, partnership um, and that while... Uh, uh, delayed discharges are dropping, uh, all we've got is a build-up in social care about to explode because that means that time frames for turnaround have to drop uh, for putting in place care at home, for example. And I'm just interested to see whether you've got different experiences on where the balance between health and social care um, is working really well. Maria. You know, my experience of health and social care partnerships at that level is, is not good enough to answer that question in any meaningful way. I need to be honest. Uh, what, yeah, Andrew, anyone else then who yeah. would feel maybe that have got more experience in that regard just to answer the, the detail of that question? Um, so... It varies. <laughs> Again, this is, this is becoming a theme. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, from a palliative care point of view, so in principle, it's so called no brainer. The interconnectedness between health and social care uh, for uh, good outputs for palliative care is you know, proven and evidence, so there, there's no issue there. I think historically, even before my time, um, it tended to be health led. You know, so commissioning and support for commissioning in palliative care tended to be health-led. And so the lead into this has been probably more health-led. And, uh, and so those uh, partnerships where um, those individuals have remained as part of that core partnership, and I mentioned this earlier, that transition has probably been easier and better and the, the relationship development hasn't been so challenging where the where the not so much the emphasis, but whereby whatever um, reorganisation it's meant that perhaps it was more social care led, the changes seem larger perhaps, and so therefore new arrangements seem to be more challenging and, and have needed to take a little bit more time to bid in. That's very general because there are examples of both in, in a different way. I, I, think, I think the point that you're making is this is perhaps more a personal thing that you've, you've, you're trying to join two enormous uh, organisations, huge organisations that historically have existed independently at the very least, funded differently. You know, health historically is always free at the point of delivery. No questions asked. You continue to deliver on the basis of demand and the demand is almost limitless. Different challenges in, in local authorities, the way, the way their funds are raised. So I think... I have a, a significant amount of sympathy with, with, after only a couple of years of putting this together, that it might not be absolutely perfect and there are still sometimes these tensions. In the room with people, that doesn't really exist. There is an absolute will with the individuals in the room who are responsible for trying to move these things forward to really try and make progress. But 
often that they have institutional and, and structural barriers to that, whether they're professional or you know, organizational, because they've still not been broken just yet, or they still haven't changed. So I've maybe not fully answered your question, but these are some of the personal reflections on, I think, some of the issues you were, you were raising there. Did you want to add something, yeah. Maria? I think you're right, David. Funded These two different organizations are funded differently, uh, but they've also got different philosophies. Yeah. You know, health being very medically orientated yeah. and social care having a social model. And those two models can come together, but it creates tension, absolutely, when you have uh, those people who, people who work in those different organisations. And coming from health, uh, my own background is health, it's really interesting to try and step into somebody else's shoes so that you can understand how that organisation works and, and better understand how you might come together. That's at a professional level. Then when you put the individual who needs that love, care and support, you, they have a completely different perspective. And that's the bit that we're trying to get over. Two different philosophies as well as think about the individual at the heart of it all. It shouldn't be that difficult, should it? We should be thinking about that individual. But it does appear to cause us organisationally as well as individually and professionally real, uh, real problems and challenges. Well, as a provider of home care in a number of IJB areas, I think we're supporting health boards and local authorities sort of on a learning curve of thinking particularly of the delayed discharge issue. Is that, um, obviously, NHS is desperate to get people out of hospital as soon as they're fit for discharge, but they don't often, historically anyway, understand the pressures that the social care sector is under. So I think that integration itself has just brought a greater understanding to that and hopefully that the next step will be how those how those two systems can work together to overcome those those issues but I think something that's quite often overlooked is the contribution that the third sector and social care makes to um, prevention agenda and the invest the upfront investment that can be made in services whether it's say befriending schemes self-management schemes to support people to live at home and to live as independently and healthily as possible and prevent those hospital admissions is coming a bit late and the focus, the balance at this point in time is very much on the delayed discharges and trying to get people home rather than that prevention agenda and trying to stop people getting into the situation where they need to go to hospital. I mean to paint a very broad picture, I think there's lots of good examples of things where places where that is working but it quite often is based on short term projects and short term funding and then the problem reoccurs when that funding ends. Alison, I mean, especially since the Scottish Government sets all these very strict targets in health care, acute care, isn't, isn't social care always going to be the poor relation? Um, well. Discuss. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think this is up there along with all you care about is pressure on bricks <laughs> as um, a completely legitimate observation and a really valuable conversation. Um, I'm, I'm always interested in any idea that there's a health culture. I, I have never worked in the NHS, I've never worked in social care or local government either. I worked in the private sector before I joined the civil service. My observation as an interested outsider is uh, there's lots of different cultures in health and there are probably several different cultures in social care and there certainly are in local government. So there's a whole mix of stuff there and sometimes that can actually be quite good fun. Some, sometimes if you see it as an opportunity to stir things up a bit, it can be quite a rich variety of views and experience that are out there. Um, we do have historically quite different ways, exactly as you say, of engaging with the NHS, even from the building that I have a desk in, in Edinburgh, the government building. Completely different uh, mechanisms for engagement, different ways of establishing targets and objectives, different funding mechanisms. In actual fact, after 10 years, I can say with my hand on my heart, I have not found anything that works the same in health as it does in local government. But I have also seen at local level, exactly as, as you have all said very eloquently, at local level, people with this variety of experience getting into a room together and sometimes doing some quite remarkably good things because they brought their various contributions to the table rather than seeing them as an impediment to, to doing something together. My own best fun experience of this was when we were writing one bit of the legislation on integration which is to do with um, outcomes. And 
uh, I had a rule that when we brought stakeholders and partners together, it was never a unilateral exchange. We always had everybody represented at once. So that it wasn't us having a conversation with the medical profession and then the next day having a conversation with social workers or whatever. We're all in together. And we had a tremendous discussion, argument, fight about the word safe. And it was one of the most interesting conversations I've ever been party to in this uh, forum because there was this extraordinary range of views about what safe meant. And the dominating feeling in the room from everyone apart from the colleagues who happened to have come from the NHS was that safe meant a doctor would tell you what to do. And safe was not a word that they associated with good care. I found it absolutely illuminating. And from that argument, I think we built a really useful discussion. So to some extent, I would say vive la différence and just embrace it. Thanks very much. And some positive thoughts, I yes. think, to end things. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our hour, which I've certainly found pretty illuminating. Thank you all for your contributions. I'm sure there's probably more questions you might want to ask afterwards. But for now, uh, we're going to have to say goodbye. And I hope you'll just give a very warm thank you to our panel.